Parsha this week, Parsha's Tazriya and Mitzorah. We're going to uh, um, take a few ideas, try to share those ideas, try to expound on those ideas. So Tazriya is the beginning, which opens up about the concepts of conception, when a, when a child is conceived, and then continues on to the concept of tuma, of purity and impurity. Tuma, impurity, impurity is something that's difficult to define um, in natural ways, because the whole concept of Tuma and Tahara is something that seemingly is spiritual, and it's something that you couldn't necessarily tell, and even if, try as they may, um, for over the years they tried to define this as some other type of physical association that happens to a human being, <clears throat> it's really something that's very spiritual. So it opens up, uh, the Torah opens up this week to tell us the concept of when uh, a woman conceives... And then after birth, vitama shivas yamim, she is now impure for seven days. Vayom um, hashmini. <clears throat> and on the eighth day, if it's a boy, you're going to give the boy a bris mila, you're going to give the boy a circumcision. And then it continues on to tell us um, how the woman remains in a state of tahara purity, yet she cannot eat, she cannot go into the temple, and certain elements of purity and impurity continue on forward until she reaches a certain time where she has to bring a sacrifice and she reaches the new state of purity again. This is the concept of, uh, the, this is this initial concept. This is where we learn part of the concept of nida from, of menstruation. Uh, the fact that a woman, a husband and wife have to go through separated periods of time. Um, times that they are permitted for each other and times that they are prohibited for each other. So on the one hand, it may seem that it's just simply, you know, best effort or, you know, good idea to be able to, uh, to keep the relationship uh, going well and therefore the husband and wife have a yearning towards each other. But it's obviously much deeper than that. And the concepts here of tumult and tahara, purity and impurity, are very difficult to understand, something that's not necessarily a physical, uh, physical malady that is associated with it. So in the beginning um, of this parsha, which talks about this concept of purity and impurity, so Rashi quotes the Medrash that says that just like the creation of man was after all of the animals, of uh, chaya and of of wild animals and, and birds, in the beginning of creation, kach toraso, so too was the Torah, nisparsha achar toras behem of. So what that means is as follows. In the beginning of creation, we have the general concept of animals being created. And then we have a concept that man is created. When is man created? On which day? Sixth day. Man is created on the sixth day. And animals are created on days preceding. So just like in the world of creation, animals are created first, followed by by man. So too when it comes to purity and impurity in defining out who is pure, who is impure, what is pure, what is impure. Animals come first, and then mankind comes second. What is that referring to? It's referring to the last week's Parsha. At the end of last week's Parsha, we spoke about the concept of foods, of animals, that are considered pure or impure. That was a general concept that we learned about. And this concept is something that's really undefinable, though we did mention um, in Shul this week that oftentimes you have people that... They may not be Jewish, but they want to consider themselves somewhat pure. So there are certain things they won't eat. They won't eat shellfish. They won't eat pork. They won't eat other things, even though they're not Jewish. Why? Because they know that the Torah defines that these things are tameh. They're impure. There's a sense of spiritual impurity that is associated with them. And it changes the way a person actually thinks and does things. Okay? Um, so there is this concept over here that's in last week's Parsha that discusses this idea is that there's a level of purity and impurity. For those of you that are vegan or vegetarian, you're already somewhat up on the game because you don't have to worry about the purity and impurity of these, of these animals, but we'll see that it actually correlates over to mankind. So on the basic concept over here, it means that there's an animal that is considered pure or impure. You can eat it if you slaughter it properly, but there's some, no matter how well you slaughter it, it's not going to actually help you. You can take a pig and slaughter as much as you want. It's not going to make a difference. The pig is not going to be considered slaughtered, and therefore it's going to be considered impure. We have discussed this in the past um, <clears throat> of the Circle of Willis. For those that remember the Circle of Willis, who doesn't remember the Circle of Willis? What are you talking about? Will anyone know what the Circle of Willis is? Mm-hmm. Cir- I remember, but I remember time ago, learning right? it. I the Circle of Willis is the 
is the way the arteries work in the, in the, in the, in the animal, right? And we said that um, only kosher animals have it actually connected to the same place so that when you slaughter it, it immediately no longer feels it. Unlike in non-kosher animals, all non-kosher animals have it. Two, it goes in two different directions. So when you cut one, it doesn't actually, uh, it doesn't actually serrate from the other one. And therefore, the other animal, the animal that's non-kosher, no matter what, if you slaughter, it's still feeling pain during that time. So that's one of the wonders of the way Hashem made, it, made the kosher animals, that the kosher animals will immediately be stunned um, the moment the knife hits that part of their, hits that part of their uh, uh, circle of willis, I believe is what it's called. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so that's only particularly on kosher animals, but not on the non-kosher animals. But more than just simply the humanity that's part of it is really the concept of purity and impurity. This concept was already understood by the beginning of time, even before the Torah was given. It was understood by man, by Adam. It was understood by Noah when Noah offered animals. Remember, he took on the ark pure and impure animals. How does he know? There was an understanding of what was considered pure and what was considered impure at the time. So therefore... When it comes to the essence of creation, inherent in creation is purity and impurity. Which means it might be something that we, to the naked eye, we can't tell, but this is something that's already set in time from the beginning of creation, the purity and impurity of animals. Noah, taking all these animals onto the ark, knows exactly how he needs to take a pair of impure and seven of the pure ones. So he knows exactly what he's taking onto the ark at that time. You had a question on that? Yeah, so, so when he was taking these animals there, all the non the pure ones, they actually walked them by themselves there because they knew they're not going to be sacrificed. But the kosher ones, uh, very good, they right? ran away, so he probably could figure okay, out. Okay, that's not in the psukim over there. It doesn't say that there that the, the other ones are running away, but it would make but sense from a He had to, to hustle, the other, had to hustle the other seven pairs because he knew that they, they knew they were being slaughtered. I don't know because at the end of the day, either you're going to die in a flood or you're going to be slaughtered. So what are you running away from, right? Okay, but I guess maybe it could be that's a medrash on that idea, right? <clears throat> Could be. At the end of last week's parsha, it says, Lahavdil bein hatamei uvein hatar. To be able to separate no distinction between pure and impure, uvein achaya nechelas, between an animal that is eaten and an animal that cannot be eaten. So there is a concept over here between tamei and tahor, and that's what ended up last week. So the Medrash tells us in this week's parsha that if you want to understand what's actually going on in this week's parsha, it's not, it's not alone by itself. What's actually happening in this week's parsha is teaching us a concept. That there is a concept of purity and impurity. And just as in creation, certain things are created first, so too when defining this in purity and impurity, it's going to follow the same pattern. It's very nice, but I don't know why the pattern is really necessary. But the Medrash goes on to tell us something interesting. And the Medrash goes on to tell us the following. Just like man was created second, so too, when it comes to defining purity and impurity, man is mentioned second. But it goes on to say the following. Um, that it, you would think that man is created last in creation, but it's not actually true. Because there are other mentions of man in creation that you and I wouldn't have noticed, but actually shows that man is created first. Such as, the Medrash goes on to explain, The Spirit of God was hovering over the water. You're familiar with that verse, that the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. The Medrash says, you know what that Spirit of God is? It's actually referring to Mashiach. The ultimate savior is hovering over the water, which means from the beginning of creation, that savior, which is a human being, is now hovering over the water. Uh, interestingly enough, I had a very long conversation with Rabbi Kravitz. Maybe this shouldn't be on the, on the recording side, but I had a long and interesting conversation with Rabbi Kravitz, Kravitz, who is from Jews for Judaism. He's a Chabad rabbi who runs Jews for Judaism, if you're familiar with him. And we had a long discussion about who Mashiach could actually be. And what is Mashiach and what Mashiach can actually be. So just a very short point just to share with you. Mashiach is something, is generally assumed to be a human being. Um, this, this ultimate savior is a human being. And that human being, there's a concept called the, the essence of Mashiach, that a person has a potential to be Mashiach. A person has potential to be the ultimate savior of every generation. Every generation has that type of person. And then there's a person who is actually Mashiach himself. Which means in every generation, there's someone that has potential to be Mashiach. And then, um, that, it may become actualized if their person is declared as Mashiach. And the way that's declared is in Israel, they're declared as Mashiach. And then, as they're declared as Mashiach, everyone accepts that individual as Mashiach. And all the nations will come under one roof. Following Mashiach will be the concept called Tchiyas HaMesim, the resurrection of the dead. 
which means those that are worthy to be resurrected will come back to life, which is one of the reasons why we are very much against cremation. Except for those who are cremated by force, everyone else, uh, if they willingly chose cremation, they will lack the bone that's in the body that, is, that enables a person to actually become back to life in resurrection. So, so comes Mashiach, and then following that comes, uh, comes the resurrection of the dead. So what he points out is that in every generation you have an opportunity, and this is a little bit of a sidebar. Every generation, there are people that have opportunities to become the greatest leaders, who are great leaders, and then they have to be declared as Mashiach, which happens in Israel. When um, seemingly from all the sources, um, it's presented from the Gemara and other places that Mashiach has to come from the living. Uh, which means Mashiach has to be someone who is a living human being who is then uh, declared as Mashiach. Now, there is one potential view that suggests that Mashiach might come from the dead, and that's the way that it's read in the Gemara, that some people understand it to be that Mashiach is coming from the dead, but that's not really the approach. What the approach means, if Mashiach was, if Mashiach would have been someone who had died already, it would have been a particular individual. Not that he is going to come from the dead, but he could have been someone from the past, is what the Gemara seems to suggest. But this was the final point that he wanted to make with me, and that was that according to Lubavitcher Rebbe himself, Lubavitcher Rebbe himself in many different places said that Mashiach um, must come from the living, and then after he comes from the living, he will then usher in the resurrection of the dead Mashiach cannot come from someone who is not alive. Okay, these are the views that he presented to me from uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe himself. So take what you can do with that. Um, <clears throat> but, he, but he presented this idea of where Mashiach comes. So we just explained, back to our regular schedule over here, we just explained the concept that the beginning of creation has hints that mankind was actually created prior to the animals. Even though in the literal meaning of the verses, it seems like mankind is after but actually, there's two other verses that show that perhaps mankind was created prior to the animals. So the Medrash goes on to explain the following. The Medrash says, Listen, if you do what you're supposed to do, then you will be like man created prior to the animals. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, then guess what? Yitosh, um, the, the gnat, the minuscule gnat, even came before you. It's a humbling experience, what this Medrash is telling us over here. If you're living up to your life's potential, then if you're living up to your life's potential, then we say, look at you, ah, wow, kingdom of the universe. You're the king of the universe. You, the human being, came before all of creation. If you don't live up to what you're supposed to do, then, says the Medrash, then guess what? You're nothing. You're worthless. The gnat, even the gnat, that annoying little bug, was created before you. So that's what the Medrash says. So which, which one is it, right? Are you created before or you created after? So says the Medrash, it could be both. In this case over here, when it comes to Tumah and Tara, purity and impurity, it can be looked at as if you were created uh, after mankind. Because if you look at your base nature of who you are as a human being, then you know what? You come after animals. You're nothing. All the animals precede you. What value do you have in this world? But if you look and you actually perfect yourself to a higher level of a human being, then you will actually see that you actually truly come before that. You know, what's interesting to note is that the Medrash presents it in two, por- two points. One is the first verse I told you, which is the Spirit of God hovers over the waters, which is a hint to Mashiach, that the Spirit of Mashiach, man was created first. Well, Mashiach is obviously pretty high up there on the uh, uh, appreciation scale. You know, he certainly is the Spirit that accomplished the most. Whether we know who that Mashiach is or not yet, but the point is that this is one of the highest caliber of human beings that could exist in the world. That one is mentioned first. The other mention is the fact that it says nefesh chaya, the soul of an animal. Soul of an animal, animals don't really have a soul. They have a life force. What is the soul of an animal? Must be referring to man. So we see that there is a hint to man being created before the animals, but explicitly in the Torah, it's not that way. Explicitly, man is created after. Why is it a hint? I'd like to suggest the following concept over here. The following concept is the reason why it's hinted to is because we're talking about something much deeper, and that is our soul. That if a person actually perfects themselves in a much deeper way, then you will be considered before man. You'll be considered created before animals. If not, then you're just simply like everybody else, like every other form of mankind who did not live up to their potential and therefore you consider after. I'm going to share with you an idea from Rav Lichtenstein Zatzal, 
whose uh, yurt site is coming this Sunday, I heard from one of his Talmidim, one of his students, that he explains as follows. If you want to understand what it means to live life properly of what this measure is talking about, then there are two things you have to look at at the beginning of creation to understand this. What are the two things that man is commanded to the beginning of creation? Do we know what man was commanded to at the beginning of creation? He's put in the garden to do what? Anybody know? To guard it. To guard it and to? Not to eat. Multiply. He's not going to multiply the garden. What's he going to do? Enjoy the fruit. Yeah, sorry. Care for it and guard it, right? La'avda, yeah. to serve it, to serve it, to care for it, mm-hmm. and to guard it. These are two different concepts. So he explains what these two concepts are. What are the two concepts? The first one, la'avda, to serve, is the word evid. What is evid? Evid is a slave. So a lot of times in our lives, we'd love to be, huh? It's also a service. Service. Service, servant, slave. Same idea. Here's the thing. We always struggle because we talk about... On Passover, on Pesach, we talk about the concept that we were slaves to Paro, and then we became free. Not true. It doesn't say that anywhere. Right? What does it say? We were slaves to Paro, to Paro, and then we became servants to God. That's what really happened. So the reason why it doesn't work well for us, because we say we were slaves to Paro, and then we became servants to God. Actually, it's the same word either way. <laughs> you were either slaves to Paro and slaves to God, servants to Paro and servants to God. How do we look at it? It's really what our mind thinks. I feel like I'm a slave right now. I feel like I'm being forced. And here, I'm not being forced. I can't wait to serve you, God. I'm excited to serve you. But the words are actually the same. That is the word evid. Evid to work. When you go to work, when a person goes to work, we're not talking about the retirees, but we're talking about the person that goes to work. And those that are retired already are really never retired. We understand how it works. And there's no such thing as retirement in Judaism. We understand that as well. But when, you, when a person goes to work, they could feel like they are a slave. Or they can feel like they're actually serving. They're doing, they're creating a purpose. So when man is put into the garden, he's put there, la'avda, to serve it. What does it mean to serve? Could be a slave, but it means to be able to have service, to be able to actually have meaning and service. What is that a reference to? Says Rabbi Chassin, that is a reference to a godly service that everybody has. Every human being has an opportunity to connect to a spiritual side of themselves, and that is... <clears throat> their religion that they have, some form of religion that they have, some type of service that they're answering to a higher authority that they feel that they're reaching and having a deeper connection. That is true avodah that we talk about, true service that we talk about. In religion, a lot of times people are used to religion and just like the things they have to do. I have to light this, eat this, make a blessing on this, but they're not necessarily connected as opposed to when you feel like you're serving God in a deeper way, you feel a deep connection, a relationship. Right? Marriage can be looked at in that way as well, where it's not just simply, oh, I'm serving. Am I serving my spouse when I take out the trash? No, not necessarily. Perhaps that this is part of the relationship that goes on here. So there's a first concept, which means that, uh, that the first goal of man or first requirement of man is to really to serve God and to develop that relationship in, in a spiritual way. When he does that, then he has another concept, and that is L'shamra, to guard the garden. What is that, a concept of guarding the garden? It means that you have a responsibility to the world to treat the world properly. It doesn't necessarily mean to recycle, but it means that you have a responsibility. How are you going to handle the world? And, uh, and you have, basically, you have a religious responsibility that exists in the world, your relationship with God and yourself. And then you have a moral responsibility of how you actually help and build and create within the world. And that, those are the two jobs that we, this is our role that we have within the world, is to have both of these ideas become one. Um, says Rav Lichtenstein, that is, was man's goal. If a person makes himself in a higher level of religious spirituality, plus a moral responsibility, then he's considered as if he has been created prior to the animals. But if not, if he just simply degenerates and allows himself to just, we'll say, eat the fruit of the land and not actually develop into a higher character, a higher being, a higher person, well, that individual can then obviously comes even after the net. He's on a lower level of the totem pole. The Swasemis explains on this idea similar, that when a, person, when a person has their life, their goal is to integrate their life, their physical and spiritual, together as one. And it's not an easy task for any of us to do, and most of the time we struggle in this idea, and things get in the way of how we deal with our spirituality, and everyone's in their own spiritual plain in a different way. But that's the goal, is really bring it together so you actually feel uplifted through that. So, meaning, if you think about it for your own selves and, and, and my own self as to how we deal with, in general, with religion in our lives, a lot of times we're just like, 
I don't do that. It doesn't, doesn't talk to me. And even if you see a person who's religious and is doing something, it may not talk to them either. They're just doing. The goal is to really integrate body and soul together so it feels like it's one unit that's actually flowing and doing the greatest things. When a person studies Torah on the highest of levels, they actually feel that sense where their body and soul is becoming one and is really having this ultimate connection. But this is what the Medrash tells over here, the beginning of the Parsha, that our ultimate goal is really to see ourselves as pure. What does pure actually mean? Pure means living to your ultimate potential. What is that ultimate potential? It means the way that we serve God in our relationship. And number two, the way we actually work with the environment and humanity and the like. And we have a moral responsibility the way we treat things. I think it's important for us to realize this, that like a lot of times you see people, uh, whether religious or non-religious, that they, you know, they may just like throw trash on the ground. This always bugged me. I could never understand why it bugged me so much. But why is it that you see some people and they'll just like, to me, I go to Ralph's. And, you know, I take my cart, I fill up my, my, my car. What do you do when you're done with your cart? Don't tell me, okay? Some people, a lot of people, just leave it there, right? Either they leave it in the spot next to them, or they leave it, you know, around another car, things like that. And when you come to Ralph's, you'll say, okay, you know what? It's because there's someone who collects the carts, you know why there's someone who collects the cards? Because people are leaving it there, just like there's someone who collects the trash on the ground because people are leaving it there, right? And that's seemingly the simplest thing we can talk about is a moral responsibility. You took out a card, so put it back. Put it back in the right place, whether it's back in the store or back in the, uh, you know, back in the thing. The other day, I brought two cards, and the woman was coming to collect all the cards. She even said thank you to me. Why should she have to say thank you? It's her job, Right? Because morally, why should we be leaving this thing out here for someone else to pick up our trash? We have a general responsibility to be able to take care of the environment. Obviously, I'm not ruining the environment by leaving my cart there, but there's just a certain element of moral responsibility of how we treat others and how we treat the world. And this is something that religion is supposed to dictate to us to help guide us in this proper path. And sometimes when you're doing things, it's just a matter of thinking ahead. You know, let's say you throw a piece of garbage out and it misses the garbage can. What do you do? You've probably seen it before. You go to the park and you see the garbage can is like filled up way over and then there's garbage all over the place. What was that guy thinking when he threw his bottle out and it never even got near the garbage can because the garbage can is so full? Maybe you could take it to another garbage can. Who knows? But you see people that are just not thinking, they're not taking that more responsibility for themselves. And this is just an example about garbage. Obviously, there's so many other things that we can use to explain that idea. Okay, um, <clears throat> we're going to go on. Um, into the Parsha. So the Parsha tells us about the concept of a bris milah. We're going to learn a few ideas about the circumcision. Ladies, uh, you're okay. You'll be fine here. Um, so it says, after the woman becomes impure, she, ha- she gives birth to a son. And now, uvayom hashmin, on the eighth day, yimol basar lato. This is like, it's like, just by the way, I just want to let you know, a woman gave birth, and you know what, you have a boy. So just do the circumcision. That's what you need to do. What is the goal of the circumcision over here? So we're going to look at a few different views to explain this concept of circumcision. There's one that is really difficult to understand. I'm just going to share it with you, and I'm going to turn to you for advice of what it actually means. Okay, you ready for this? I'm going to turn to you for this one. Okay? The Gemara suggests, when I say suggests, the commentaries seem to say that this is not the ultimate reason. It's giving you one of many, many reasons. And what does the Gemara actually suggest? The Gemara suggests the following. The reason why the bris mila is on the eighth day is because we just learned the verse that said that if she gives birth to a boy, she is now tame. She is impure, forbidden to her husband, cannot have relations, cannot touch, forbidden to her husband. On the eighth day, she's now biblically pure, rabbinically not pure, rabbinically minimum of 12 days, and usually going to be longer anyway, the amount of time the woman is actually going to bleed. So now, on the eighth day, you can do the bris milah, because on the eighth day, she is now pure. What does that mean, says the Gemara? How could it be that you're going to have a great meal where everyone's going to rejoice for this child that's born, and yet the husband and wife are going to be sad? Okay, that's what the Gemara says. The husband and wife are going to be sad. Why? Because they are impure. Okay, the woman is impure. They're going to be sad. So we can't do that. We're going to delay to the eighth day. Now, I'm just going to turn to you now. Does this make rational sense to you? Okay, so tell me why it doesn't make rational sense to you. For, for me, it would be one is not rational because it's not about them. It's about the child. It's not about them. It's about the child. Okay, good. 
and what else? Like, like eight days, so he can actually go through Shabbos. So oh, like, no, no, no. You, you're trying to give me your own ideas. Oh. I want to know why this doesn't oh, make sense. Answer. It's not mine. <laughs> I understand. So I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to uncover this idea. This has bothered me for a while. Okay, so the Gemara simply says, it's not right that the husband and wife should be sad when she's in a state of impurity and everyone else is going to be happy. Why is impurity sad? Why is impurity sad? Okay, good question. Right? So, and the simple meaning of what the Gemara says is because of the fact... Um, <clears throat> so, the Gemara just says they're all going to be happy and the husband and wife are going to be sad. It doesn't say why. It just says they're going to be sad. Right? What's the sadness? So, it's always assumed that the sadness is simply because they, you know what, they can't be together. Really? You know? Like, I, is that really what it is? It's only been eight days. It's only been seven days. The woman is in probably a lot of pain anyway. Right? Would you agree? I don't know. I can't talk for that. I can only tell you I had a kidney stone. That's all I know. <laughs> all I know is that I have to say, for the record, I had a kidney stone. And when I was speaking to my grandmother about my kidney stone, she said, look, I had a kidney stone. And I, and whatever, she had whatever, let's say four births. Maybe she had more, but she had four births. And a kidney stone, a kidney stone is much worse. That's what she said. So I felt very vindicated, you know. I don't know if it's true. Uh, but she said <laughs> when she had a kidney stone, she wanted to take a knife and just stab at any human right. being that was around her. So <clears throat> maybe. Um, so I felt really good. That I felt really deeply connected to all women in the world. Um, <laughs> but if the Gemara says that they're going to be sad, why are they sad when the baby is born? Before they were doing the same thing. They, they were not together for 12 days. All of a sudden they're sad. Well, who, who says they were not together for 12 days? No, I'm saying that before, like, because if it's, you're saying, or seven days, whatever is the period of... Okay, whatever, whatever that period of time. Whatever is the period right. of the time, and we're assuming that it's more, that they're not allowed to be together more than these eight days. It Otherwise, has to be, right, that's yeah, the key. Yeah, that's the key, so it's more than eight days. So, and before, before the baby is born, you know, when she goes to cycle... Right, she's still but like, it's not, right. So, so it's not, that's that's key, the key is not talking about the before, because they're she's pregnant for nine months, and now suddenly they have this child, and now this child, and now she's in a state of sadness because, at seven. Because they are afraid about the, the baby. baby. So yeah, is afraid. So that's another view that the maybe it's the baby, baby, right? Yeah, that's another view. We'll get to that view in a second. But before you get to that view about we're worried about the baby, how's the baby going to handle this? Uh, how is the baby going to be able to, you know, we're going to give this circumcision. How is it going to handle this? Not easy. I'll, si- I'll share with you a side story. Just to, don't spread this, even though it's being recorded. Okay. <laughs> so the side story was that um, someone came to me and they said, I asked them, did you have a circumcision? And they said, uh, yeah, let me check. I checked with his mother. So his mother said, yeah, he had a circumcision, but I don't know if it was good. We did it the first day. The doctor did it when the baby was born. When he was born, we did it the first day in the hospital. So I said, that's a problem. Because it has to be on the eighth day. It can't be on the first day. But she did it on the first day. Non-Jewish doctor, the whole story. So, okay, we got we to gotta do something about it. We have to go ahead and we have to fix this. How are we going to fix this? Well, the simplest way to fix it is if the circumcision was done properly. There's a concept called hatafas dambris, which means it's the prick. Right? You take a needle prick and then you, you drop a little bit of blood and then you're okay. Then, then it's done properly, okay? So they go to the, do- they go to the, they go to the mohel, the, how do you say mohel in English? Moyo, right? <laughs> how do you say mohel in English? The circumciser, right? <laughs> it's like a, the next Marvel superhero, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> the Avengers and the circumciser. Okay, so they go to the mohel, like, there's no English word for mohel, right? It's just a mohel, right? So they go to the mohel, and he takes a look and he goes, Whoa. This is, not, this is not your normal uh, circumcision over here. We need to call a urologist over here. So you go to the urologist together with the mole, and uh, the, mole, the urologist looks and he goes, whoa, this is the worst job I've ever seen in my life. And he said, if this guy, so he says, we got to do real surgery on this guy because he has so much scar tissue. If he would not get taken care of this now, 30 years later, he probably would develop cancer from this particular circumcision that he had on day one. So 30 years later, when he had his proper, uh, proper circumcision, he was actually able to save himself from uh, potential, potential danger. Okay, <clears throat> so that's just an interesting story. So this is what's bothering me. What's, hap- what's happening on this day? They're sad. Why are they sad? 
seemingly because she's in a state of tuma, or the state of impurity. It's very hard to understand what this concept means, but we'll just mention a few concepts over here, off the cuff. Concept number one is that, um, that in order to celebrate this child, this child is not coming from himself alone, he's coming as a partner with Hashem and the two parents. So if there's sadness in any of that, then the partnership is going to be considered sad. Um, and then there's general sadness. When we talk about sadness here, I'm assuming it refers to some other element of spiritual sadness that exists. I didn't see this written anywhere, but there must be some other, other spiritual sadness that exists within the people that therefore we cannot have the bris milah on that day. So it's not just simply because of health, you know, we don't want to give them the baby on day one, because technically there may not be any difference of day two, three, or four and day eight when it comes to the health of the baby. But the Torah mandates that it cannot be till day eight, and we'll explain that. But there must be some other type of sadness that exists, perhaps as a spiritual sadness that is overcome on this couple, whether it's because they're separate from each other, whether because she's in a state of impurity, or some other type of spiritual thing that prevents that from actually happening. Next is um, <clears> that the Orachim quotes a Medrash of Zohar, and this is what Alex was presenting. We want to wait eight days. The reason why we're eight, waiting 80 day, eight days is because we want the child to have the strength to be able to withstand this surgical procedure. What happens on day eight? What happens? They come the blood. The blood is... The blood, okay. And they survive. Billy Rubin, Shabbos. blood clotting, all these different things and that are happening over there. Shabbos. And they survived the Shabbos. Says the Zohar, when you've gone through a Shabbos, then you now have spiritual strength that's going to give you physical strength to do things. Which means that is a message for us in general of what Shabbos is really all about. Shabbos is not just simply respite, being able to relax and have a good time. Shabbos is spiritual rest that actually gives you strength for the rest of the week. And that's how you should actually look at Shabbos within your lives, is to be able that when, even though you're not physically working, but there's something spiritual that overtakes a person that gives a person extra strength. Um, <clears throat> and that's our Pincus presents that sometimes spiritual strength, something spiritual can actually strengthen a person. We know this about Yaakov Avinu, Jacob, our forefather. He was studying and studying and studying Torah for all those years. When he goes to meet his future wife or wives, there's a, a rock on the well that nobody can lift off. Tell me, what was he doing while he was studying over there? Was he sitting and lifting weights? Were the books really that heavy? No, nothing there. He comes to the well, boom, takes it, throws it down, is able to lift it off and put it back on the well. Right? Torah just seems to mention that he can just do that. How does he do it? Where does he have this brute force to be able to do this? Where does he have the strength from? It's not clear. It says Zerpinka, something spiritual has overtaken the person to give them that strength. And similarly, we have this on Shabbos. What happens on Shabbos? Why do we eat so much on Shabbos? Because we want to. What's the other reason why we eat so much on Shabbos? Two souls to feed. Two souls to feed, because you have what's called the Neshama Yisera, the extra soul that enters into a person. That extra soul, I don't know, maybe it makes you hungrier. I'm not sure what it is. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't it's like, survive. I am famished, I feel like, you know. It's an extra soul, right? So like, for whatever reason, that soul gives you the ability to have more room in your stomach. As we know, we don't gain weight on Shabbos. The reason why we don't gain weight on Shabbos, as we said many times before, is... Because you're actually not allowed to weigh yourself on Shabbos. <laughs> so the weight only comes after Shabbos, when you get on the scale. And that's when you actually know when that actually happens. Um, <clears throat> okay, fine. Lastly on this idea is the Maral explains, the Maral of Prague explains the following idea, that seven, the number seven in Hebrew is Sheva. The number Sheva, uh, like Ba Sheva, right? Um, I do have to share a story that I mentioned yesterday in Shul. It was amazing. Uh, I don't know what it means. But uh, I had my sphere book. Were you there? Yeah. yeah, I had my sphere book that I pulled off the shelf in my house. That goes through every night what the spiritual way you're supposed to work on yourself is. I haven't taken that in at least a year because <coughs> sphere is what we're up to now. But um, I must have taken that before that. And that yesterday day was Adina's birthday. She just turned three years old, right? And I pulled the book off my shelf and I came to show, we're in the middle of sphere, right? We're up to like day 17, 18. You know, I just, I forgot to pull it off every other day. I just kept forgetting to bring it to shul. I finally remembered to bring it to shul. And I open up the book and there's pictures from her birth on her birthday. Wrapped in that little whatever, little hat on, right? On her birthday is when I found those pictures. I don't know what that means, but it must be a wonderful thing. Anyway, so the morale explains, <laughs> that story is brought to you by me. Okay, the morale explains that the number seven is from the word sheva. What does the word sheva actually mean? Shin bet ayin, that word in Hebrew is the same word as sava. 
Ve'achalta v'savata u'v'erachta, as many of you may know, is what we say in Berkat Amazon, is in our benching. And that concept is that when I eat and I'm satiated, I'm going to bless God. Okay, that's our biblical verse that we have for Berkat Amazon, for being able to bench. The word sheva is the same word as sava, same exact letters, just the way you pronounce the, the, the dot on the shin. What does sheva mean? Sava means to be full. When we talk about something being complete, it means it's full. It's maxed out. The week, the Shavua, the week that we have is full. That's what Sheva, the seven, number seven, represents, a sense of fullness. Everything within nature falls in the realm of seven. We went through this already about the musical notes. I don't remember. How many is it? Seven. seven. Okay, good. I got it right. Okay. <laughs> if you said eight, I would have said I got it right also. Fine. <laughs> seven is a sense of fullness. What does eight mean? How do you say eight in Hebrew? Shmona. What is Shmona? Shmona comes the word Shamein. Shamein means fat. Shmena. Shemen is oil. It's fat and oil. Right? That the word Shemen in Hebrew is that, is that concept. So what does it actually mean? Eight. There's seven, which is a sense of fullness. I'm satisfied. It's complete. And then there's Shmona. Shmona eight actually means beyond satisfied. I'm overfull. I'm fat. What does that mean? It's beyond what the regular level of nature actually is. So that means it's much more than full. Therefore, what it means is, Uvayom Hashmini, on the eighth day, you will give a circumcision to the child, to the boy. What that actually means is that we are the human being, the male human being is created somewhat complete, looks complete, but we go beyond that. We go beyond that level of completeness to make it Shmona, to go Fuller, what does that fuller mean? It means going beyond nature. Seven is a representation of nature. Eight means the concept of beyond nature, which we've discussed many times before, like the concept of Hanukkah being eight days as well. So eight is beyond nature, which means we're elevating, which is why the bris milah is on the eighth day. And it's for this reason why the bris milah, if a baby's born properly, properly, if a baby has a, if it's a vaginal birth as opposed to a C-section or anything else, if there's a regular birth that happens there, what we call that? A V-back, right? Anybody? I'm the only one in a V-back, right? After C-section? No, no, V-back is a regular, right? No, V-back is going back to... Vaginal after it, oh, it's vaginal after. Okay, fine. If a person is born through, I, my wife is not going to be happy with me that I get it wrong. Okay, <laughs> if uh, <clears throat> if a person is born in a in a in a regular uh, regular way, meaning a regular vaginal birth, so therefore, if the eighth day is on Shabbos, then you will actually give a bris meal on Shabbos. Any other time, you will not give a bris meal on Shabbos, and the reason being is that when the child is born, so eight will supersede seven. Because of, this, because of this aspect over here, bris milah can actually push, push off Shabbos because eight is then considered higher than seven, but only in that way. And last we're going to speak about tonight is the concept of Lashon Hara. So a good part of Tazria and the rest of Mitzorah is really going to speak about Saras, is going to speak about the whole concept of um, this spiritual physical affliction that happens on a person which is not is leprosy but not called leprosy at all some type of spots other things that happen on a human being on clothing and on a building is where it can occur and it's not mold um it's something else that's actually occurring and therefore it's based on spiritual things that happen the coin has to come in and inspect and figure out what is actually going on here they might have to destroy the clothing they might have to destroy the house and they might they would otherwise have to quarantine the individual until they've actually purified themselves. So what it is referring to over here at the beginning of Parshat Mitzorah, it says, Zos tia Torah HaMitzorah. This is the Torah of the Mitzorah. So the Gemara learns from this, Zos Torah Motzi Shemra. This is the Torah, these are the teachings of the one who is bearing false uh, information. Motzi Shemra is when you start telling something incorrect about somebody else, and you start leading on false information about somebody else. So there is a concept that we have about Motsi Shemra, which is when it's not true, when you say something false about somebody else. And there is a concept called Lashon Hara, or Lashon Hara, which is when it is true. So if I say something bad about somebody else that's true, saying that it's true is not going to help you. It just means it's Lashon Hara. If it's false, then it goes in the category of Motsi Shemra. Both are terrible sins, both which destroy the human being, 
inside out and destroys communities and so many other things. Even if I'm frustrated with the person and they're doing something wrong, for me to tell it over to somebody else, it's still called Lashon Hara, even though it might be true. If there's Toelis, if there's a purpose for it that's going to help the person improve in some way or another, then, there's, then there are ways, but there are laws that are associated with how we do this. So I heard an idea, quote in the name of, of Mayor Tversky, um, that explains the following. What is this idea of Lashon Hara? Uh, Lashon Hara, one of the concepts that we have, is that someone does something wrong to me, so I want to go and tell someone about it. Usually that's how it happens. But it doesn't have to be that. It may not be something about they did wrong to me. It may just be like someone did something and I, whatever, I don't like the guy. I'm bothered. I'm not happy with my life. I go tell somebody else. So I go over to so-and-so and I say, hey, I can't believe you. You got to believe what this, right? I remember this is what we're growing up. You're not going to believe what the rabbi said in shul. Unbelievable, Right? And it was like, you never knew, you never know what, what was going to happen when someone got, went over to somebody's house. It was like, oh, the rabbi spoke with this and someone, someone's eye rolled because someone likes what the rabbi has to say, someone doesn't like what the rabbi has to say. So it's like, you can never win because someone's going to speak what the rabbi said and someone else is going to be offended. All right, so now when someone says something bad about somebody else, what's the root cause? What's happening that that happens if they say something bad? So different reasons why it happens. So Mary Torsky suggests in the following scenario. Imagine someone does something to me. I'm bothered. So I need to tell somebody else. Oh, I, can't, I gotta tell you what so-and-so did to me. I'm so bothered. What's the reason why we do that? The reason why we do it is because we feel hurt. We feel pained. And we feel like we deserve better. How could a person treat me this way? Do you know what he said about me? Do you know what he did to me? I can't believe this. I feel bothered by this. So therefore, Ruvain said something to Shim- did something to Shimon. Shimon's bothered. Shimon's going to go over to his friend Levi, and he's going to say, Levi, you got to hear what Ruvain did to me. It's, it's really bugging me. I really don't like it. And again, not all the cases are like this way. It could be just, he didn't do anything to you. You just don't like the guy. You want to share something negative about the person. So when you do that, the reason why you're doing that is because you feel an emotional gap. I don't feel whole for one particular reason or another. Either I'm not happy with my life, and therefore you're bugging me about your life. You're, the way you live your life is bothering me. I don't like the way you do things, so I'm going to speak about you. Or you did something directly to me, so therefore I'm going to speak about you. Why? Because inside I feel an emotional loss within myself. I feel a gap that goes on inside myself, and I don't feel like anyone understands what I'm actually going through, so I need to share it with somebody else. But, says our Mary Torsky, if you would understand that you're never alone in any one of these experiences, rather, if you realize that God actually feels your pain, God knows exactly what's going on in your life, He knows exactly what you went through, whether someone said something directly to you, or you're bothered by the way someone does something, if you knew that you had an emotional connection to God, you wouldn't necessarily feel the need to go say it over to somebody else. If you realize that God is truly there and he feels your pain, then you won't need to actually validate your emotions with somebody else. This is what the Gemara tells us in the Gemara and Shabbos, that if you're insulted, our role is to not to insult back. If we're defamed, our role is to stay silent. And that's where the greatest blessings actually come to an individual uh, because we realize that we're not alone. We realize that God is actually w- with us. Or Adabar Ava, Gemara asked the question. He said to him, tell us, what gave you long life? Why did you live so, such long days? So he said, because in all of his days, he never got angry at his wife. He never, got, he never raised his voice in his household. And this is what really where longevity actually comes to a person. When a person doesn't feel bad about their life, doesn't feel like someone's bothering them or getting involved or, or messing up their life or doing something wrong, whether it's their life or somebody else's, and this way it would actually protect us from actually not hurting other people with the Lashon Haras. Because otherwise what would happen simply, someone hurts us, we go and spread bad things about that person, and it just keeps going in snowballing effect and hurting more and more people. And it's hard. It's difficult. It's one of the diff- most difficult things for a person to deal with. But this is the struggle that we have, and our goal is to be able to stay silent whenever we possibly can. Um, so that's the general idea. Tonight, I just want to share that in shul, um, we lit candles for, um, for the soldiers who passed away, different soldiers. We, we were given different names. Uh, if, you were to, if you did take upon yourself a name, you should light a candle for them. But it's very, very important that we can actually do something for someone that gave up their life for the, for the land of Israel uh, and, and fighting for us. So it's just a, it's an important thing that within our lives we should be able to recognize there are other people that are living their lives for us, for, our, for ourselves, for our countries, for our communities. And it's a special bracha as we, we enter into Yom HaZikaron, uh, the time of remembrance when you can remember those people that fought, uh, that fought for our lives. So uh, their neshama should have a bracha, should have an aliyah, should be elevated. And we too should become elevated through all the things that we do. For every bit of Torah and mitzvahs that we learn, we should all become elevated and really feel like we're Adam 
to the beginning of creation, before all the other animals, because we're living a life of true meaning, purpose, and connection to God, and at the same time, moral responsibility to the world as well. We'll stop here, take any questions. So, so one question, so when it says that like, the spirit of Mashiach was hovering over the waters, right? And, uh, and it, like Midrash says, that there is a chamber where like some people, like 10 people actually in this chamber, like the holiest people, and some of them right. came there alive, and Mashiach is one of them. So, so Mashiach is there all the time, and waiting to but get But it's one here. soul. It's but one, is, it, one particular but soul. Is, it, is it considering the soul or a body? It's not a body. At this point, it's, it's a, soul. a soul. At this point, it's so a soul. the soul of... The soul of Mashiach will enter into different people's bodies as, uh, as time goes through. And this, does this soul actually, like, soul... That soul, when a person is declared a Mashiach, he will actually know it. That's no, what it seems to be. Like, is it like the soul like of Adam? Or like Usually it's that guy in the street corner that's like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, you must serve me. No, it's but not it's going to be like one of the souls that like complete soul? It's a complete soul, complete seemingly soul, a complete soul. That, like uh, the soul of Adam too or no? I, it's a semi- oh, I don't know, because Adam wasn't I'm created like, then according to that. According to that, Mashiach was created before Adam, right? That's what it would seem to be. <laughs> Necessarily, every child who's eighth day following on Shabbat correct. can have a priest. Correct. Not every child. That's correct. So, who, who is the sound? So, if a child is born out of a C-section and their eighth day is Saturday, so they won't have a bris meal on Saturday. So, only if it's natural birth. Only yeah. natural birth. Yeah. But if two, two kids die too, right? If two two sons died, the third one they are, they don't have to do. They religion. wouldn't necessarily do it on the eighth day, right? I think in that they case to, they can wait. They would wait. Yeah. Um, Obviously, if the baby's sick, you wouldn't do it either. Um, but in the case when it's a regular natural birth, because it says, Yishaki Tazrev Yalda Zachar. Yalda means it has to be a vaginal birth. If it was anything but a vaginal birth, so then, then, you, wouldn't, um, then you wouldn't actually do the bris so on the eighth day. Do like on the first day or? No, no, any day after day eight. Any day after, anything before day eight is not valid. But if the eighth day is Shabbos, then you can't actually do it on the eighth day. So that's the general idea. Oh, 